Keep the Aspidistra flying by George Orwell. Keep the Aspidistra flying. First published in 1936. Is a socially critical novel by George Orwell. It is set in 1930s London. The main theme is Gordon Comstock's romantic ambition to defy worship of the money god and status, and the dismal life that results. Title Significance The Aspidistra is a hardy, long-living plant that is used as a house plant in England, and which can grow to an impressive, even unwieldy size. It was especially popular in the Victorian era in large part because it could tolerate not only weak sunlight but also the poor indoor air quality that resulted from the use of oil lamps and, later, coal gas lamps. They had fallen out of favor by the 20th century. Following the advent of electric lighting. Plot summary. Gordon Comstock has declared there. On what he sees as an overarching dependence on money by leaving a promising job as a copywriter for an advertising company called New Albion. At which he shows great dexterity. And taking a low paying job instead, ostensibly so he can write poetry. Coming from a respectable family background in which the inherited wealth has now become dissipated. Gordon resents having to work for a living. The war, and the poetry. However, aren't going particularly well and, under the stress of his self-imposed exile from affluence, Gordon has become absurd, petty and deeply neurotic. Comstock lives without luxuries in a bedsit in London, which he affords by working in a small bookshop owned by a Scot, McKechnie. He works intermittently at a magnum opus he plans to call London Pleasures, describing a day in London. Meanwhile, his only published work, a slim volume of poetry entitled Mice, collects dust on the remainder shelf. He is simultaneously content with his meager existence and also disdainful of it. He lives without financial ambition and the need for a good job. But his living conditions are uncomfortable and his job is boring. Comstock is obsessed by what he sees as a pervasion of money, the money god, as he calls it behind social relationships. Feeling sure that women would find him more attractive if he were better off. At the beginning of the novel, he senses that his girlfriend Rosemary Waterloo, whom he met at New Albion and who continues to work there, is dissatisfied with him because of his poverty. An example of his financial embarrassment is when he is desperate for a pint of beer at his local pub but has run out of pocket money and is ashamed to catch a drink off his fellow lodger. Flaxman. One of Comstock's last remaining friends. Philip Ravelston, a Marxist who publishes a magazine called Antichrist, agrees with Comstock in principle, but is comfortably well off himself and this causes strains when the practical miseries of Comstock's life become apparent. He does, however, Endeavour to publish some of Comstock's work and his efforts, unbeknownst to Comstock, had resulted in mice being published via one of his publisher contacts. Gordon and Rosemary have little time together. She works late and lives in a hostel, and his bitch of a landlady forbids female visitors to her tenants. Then one evening, having headed southward and having been thinking about women, this women business in general, and Rosemary in particular, he happens to see Rosemary in a street market. Rosemary won't have sex with him but she wants to spend a Sunday with him, right out in the country. Near Burnham Beaches. At their parting. As he takes the tram from Tottenham Court Road back to his bedsit. He is happy and feels that somehow it is agreed between them that Rosemary is going to be his mistress. However, what was intended as a pleasant day out away from London's grime turns into a disaster when, though hungry, they opt to pass by a rather low-looking pub, and then, not able to find another pub, are forced to eat an unappetizing lunch at a fancy, overpriced hotel. Gordon has to pay the bill with all the money he had set aside for their jaunt and worries about having to borrow money from Rosemary. Out in the countryside again. They are about to have sex for the first time when she violently pushes him back. He wasn't going to use contraception. He rails at her, money again, you see, 
You say you can't have a baby, you mean you don't, because you'd lose your job and I've got no money and all of us would starve. Having sent a poem to an American publication, Gordon suddenly receives from them a check worth £10, a considerable sum for him at the time. He intends to set aside half for his sister Julia, who has always been there to lend him money and support. He treats Rosemary and Ravelston to dinner, which begins well. But the evening deteriorates as it proceeds. Gordon, drunk, tries to force himself upon Rosemary but she angrily rebukes him and leaves. Gordon continues drinking, drags Ravelston with him to visit a pair of prostitutes. And ends up broken in a police cell the next morning. He is guilt-ridden over the thought of being unable to pay his sister back the money he owes her. Because his five-pound note is gone, given to, or stolen by, one of the prostitutes. Ravelston pays Gordon's fine after a brief appearance before the magistrate, but a reporter hears about the case, and writes about it in the local paper. The ensuing publicity results in Gordon losing his job at the bookshop, and, consequently, his relatively comfortable lifestyle. As Gordon searches for another job, his life deteriorates, and his poetry stagnates. After living with his friend Ravelston, Gordon ends up working, this time in Lambeth. At another bookshop and cheap two-penny lending library owned by the sinister Mr. Cheeseman, where he's paid an even smaller wage of 30 shillings a week. This is 10 shillings less than he was earning before, but Gordon is satisfied, the job would do. There was no trouble about a job like this, no room for ambition, no effort, no hope. Determined to sink to the lowest level of society Gordon takes a furnished bed sitting room in a filthy alley parallel to Lambeth Cut. Both Julia and Rosemary. In feminine league against him seek to get Gordon to go back to his good job at the new Albion Advertising Agency. Rosemary, having avoided Gordon for some time, suddenly comes to visit him one day at his dismal lodgings. Despite his terrible poverty and shabbiness, they have sex but it is without any emotion or passion. Later, Rosemary drops in one day unexpectedly at the library. Having not been in touch with Gordon for some time, and tells him that she is pregnant. Gordon is presented with the choice between leaving Rosemary to a life of social shame at the hands of her family, since both of them reject the idea of an abortion, or marrying her and returning to a life of respectability by taking back the job he once so deplored at the new Albion with its £4 weekly salary. He chooses Rosemary and respectability and then experiences a feeling of relief at having abandoned his anti-money principles with such comparative ease. After two years of abject failure and poverty, he throws his poetic work London Pleasures down a drain, marries Rosemary, resumes his advertising career, and plunges into a campaign to promote a new product to prevent foot odor. In his lonely walks around mean streets, aspidistras seem to appear in every lower middle class window. As the book closes, Gordon wins an argument with Rosemary to install an Aspidistra in their new small but comfortable flat off the Edgware Road. End of the summary. Thank you. Thank you.